I have a friend from a, a town called Wajia. It's a very, very dry place now, but it never used to be that dry. In, back then, it was there was a river and it was green and lush and big trees and there was lots of pasture and they had lots of livestock. And he said there were elephants around all the time. And, that, and it's quite well known that that's in that area, there were lots of elephants. And he said that when they were children going to school, they would walk to school and the boys would play a game which was to run under the belly of the elephants on the way to school. You're kidding. Wow. And yeah, and he said that that was that was the norm. Nobody ever got hurt. Salam and hello everyone. My name is Lily Bikana Piper and thank you so much for joining us today. Every year on my birthday, I go to Nairobi National Park. It is my favorite place in this city. I make sure my kids get up early, we pack our breakfast, and we head out to sit in nature and enjoy the beautiful sights and sounds. It's my just favorite day of the year, besides it being my birthday. I just, I just love being immersed in the nature and the wildlife that this city has to offer. I think Nairobi is the last city in the world that has a habitat for wildlife in the middle of an urban oasis. It's quite incredible. And yet that incredible beauty and that tremendous wildlife that is iconic and world renowned is quickly being threatened and slowly fading away. Nairobi, like cities and communities across the world is facing a climate crisis, biodiversity degradation, and threats to its natural habitats at an alarming rate. Here in Africa, we are responsible for less than 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And yet, we are suffering at a faster rate than the rest of the world. According to the UN Environmental Program, Africa is the most vulnerable region in the world when it comes to the changing climate. Five of the 10 countries most impacted by climate change are here in the continent. And we're currently living through the worst drought in 40 years in this region. When it comes to our wildlife, we have fewer than 25,000 lions left in this beautiful con continent. The lion, which has become a symbol for the pride that we all feel in living and having our homes here. But there's also some hope. We've also seen that the elephant population here in Kenya is starting to increase. And in the last few years, there's been an increase from about of about 5% since 2021. Today on the show, I am really honored to have Dr. Paula Kahumbu join me to talk about wildlife, about nature, about biodiversity, about habitats, about the climate of this place that we get to call home. Dr. Kahumbu is the CEO of Wildlife Direct, an organization that advocates for the preservation of Kenya's beautiful landscapes and wildlife. Under her leadership, they have been advocating for wildlife and communities. They have produced two seasons of a TV show that you can see on YouTube, at least season one, called Wildlife Warriors. Together with the former First Lady of Kenya, Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta, they led the campaign Hands Off Our Elephants to advocate for the end of poaching of elephants in this beautiful country. Dr. Kumba was awarded the Grand Warrior by the Kenyan president for her extraordinary service to habitats here in Kenya. Over the last few years, Dr. Kahumba's voice, though, has gone beyond Kenya's borders, and it's a voice that we very much need to listen to and pay attention to. Her advocacy and her education and her expertise has started to infiltrate some of the most important places across the globe, where not only policies are being made, but also films are being made that are telling the story of this continent and its wildlife, its communities, and its landscapes. She's taught conservation at Princeton University, where she also has her PhD in elephant ecology. In 2021, Dr. Kahumbi was awarded the Rolex National Geographic Explorer of the Year Award, which is truly just an extraordinary honor to be awarded one of the most extraordinary thinkers around wildlife in the world. In 2021, she's also given the Whitley Gold Award, the highest award for conservation in the United Kingdom, for her tireless commitment to preserving wildlife and habitats in Kenya and beyond. And just this last year, Financial Times named her one of the 25 most influential women in the world. Amina Mohammed, who nominated her and is the former cabinet secretary for sports, culture, and heritage in Kenya, and the ambassador to the UN said of Dr. Kahumbu, 
Paula has the ability to look at conservation issues as a whole, identify the priorities, where the dangers are real, where extinction is a real possibility, and address them. Many people are doing, many people are capable of doing the advocacy, but she is unique in raising issues and providing possible solutions too. And that, my friends, that is what we need. We need solutions to preserving the beauty and the heritage of this place. So it's my great honor to welcome Dr. Paula Kahumbu to Salam and Hello. Paula Karibu, so happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Lily. What a what a great introduction. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, as we were saying with our producers, you have to give people their flowers when you have a chance. And it's an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you for being with us. You're most welcome. So, you know, Paula, you wear so many hats. I've mentioned just a few of them. You are an educator, you're an advocate, you're a filmmaker, but your career started off in the study and in the wonder of elephants. So let's start there. Why elephants, Paula? Why did you choose to hone in on that spectacular species? Well, I always wanted to work with wild animals. I knew that I loved being out in nature and I have to admit, I didn't really like spending that much time with people. I find people <laughs> complicated and difficult to manage and, and, and really to understand. I found animals much easier to understand. And I started off actually studying monkeys and realizing that we can study monkeys as individuals because I learned how to identify individual vervet monkeys, baboons, and other species from their faces. Okay. And I found that fascinating, but elephants also are individuals. And just like humans, you can relate to them as individuals. They have many um, traits that are so similar to human beings, but they're not primates. And that's really fascinating. And at the time that I did my PhD, it was after I had already said no to elephants. And I had said no initially because I thought they were going to go extinct. I I it was probably the one time in my life when I made a very conscious, almost economic decision. There's no point studying these animals. They're about to go extinct. Why bother? I, and I went off and I studied monkeys. And then I came back when I saw that elephants' populations were recovering and they needed us more than ever. And I went to study elephants in the Shimba Hills in southern Kenya. That research was really ecological, but my interest was on applied conservation. I wanted to understand how elephants alter landscapes, how important they are to ecosystems and what we could do to help save them. And just spending time with elephants, it's quite, uh, I want to say it's its mesmerizing. Once you start watching them and studying them, you don't want to, you don't want to leave the forest. You don't want to give up. You want to just stay there. And going back to university to write it up was extremely painful, but essential. I had to do it. And then realizing that elephants were not out of jeopardy, even though the first ivory burn gave them some breathing room, there were efforts to reopen the ivory trade again in 2000 and 2002, and then again in 2008. And I realized that there was no point just studying animals. There's no point getting, um, I don't know, just entertaining your own curiosity and having fun uh, learning because it is amazing just to be learning all the time when these animals are are under so much pressure so i so, moved into more advocacy yeah i want to i want to go back to the elephants a little bit and and what you said about how they were mesmerizing and i'm struck by that struck also by the fact that you said you enjoy animals a bit more than people like I, i'm a people person but i can i can relate to that we, we got our first family pet during during COVID. We got a puppy and I now am more of an animal person. <laughs> but tell me what elephants taught you, Paula, that drew you in to the advocacy. So I can see both the state of their well-being being something that caused alarm, you know, the poaching trade peaking again, but also you spent significant time with them. And I've read about I have one story in particular, how when you were in the field once and they all, you were surrounded by elephants and they all just sat down and went to sleep around you and how that mm -hmm. really captured your imagination. 
So what have yeah. elephants also taught you that continues to fuel your advocacy for them? You know, when I was doing my PhD, I was interested in their behavior, but I was interested in their how they interact uh, with the vegetation around them, how elephants change nature and how nature changes elephants too. Mm -hmm. Savannah elephants live in very large herds and bulls also form quite large groups. But when those same elephants are in forests, they behave very differently. And they alter forests in a different way that they alter savannas. And I found that really interesting. Uh, it means that they really are engineering our African landscapes. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I was curious about whether whether they were destroying forests, which was actually the reason why our elephants were in trouble. Because in the 1960s, so before I was even born, there was a very big initiative to cull elephants, to just shoot down elephants, just the way you might reduce your cattle, uh, because they were considered to be causing too much damage in the environment, because they destroy trees. And this idea that you should just choose a number and say, this number of elephants is the right number of elephants. And we killed the rest of them. And they killed thousands and thousands and thousands of elephants. And it didn't work. And, and Paula, and when you're saying they killed, is this communities? Because, you know, human wildlife conflict is, of course, still something we're still dealing with today. Were these communities, right. was it a Not government community. initiatives? It was, this was uh, during the colonial time. Okay. And it was a government decision to manage elephants. And it still happens in some African countries where there is a government decision to reduce elephants to what they call the carrying capacity for elephants. But elephants are unlike cows or other animals that we herd and manage and put it behind stockades at night. Elephants behave and feed differently. They feed differently in different seasons, um, depending on whether they are full grown or young, whether females or males, whether they are migrating or staying in a certain area. So their, their behavior has a huge impact on the environment around them. And if elephants are scared because they're being hunted, they will form very dense, large herds. There will be thousands of elephants all packed together. And of course, that is going to cause huge damage wherever they are. Massive right. eating machine, right? Um, but if elephants are not under pressure, they're calm, they're relaxed, they will spread out and they will eat in a very different way. And they will not cause the destruction that you see when they're uh, you know, under, under, under threat. And um, some of this nuance was lost on people. We had caused so much damage to elephants that we're beginning to study elephants under stress and assume that that is what a normal elephant is, but it's not. And one of the things that really um, moved me when I was studying, I had a, my son, he was only two and a half years old. He was a baby, but he was, he, I didn't want to leave him at home. So he would come with me everywhere. We would go deep in the forest with my team and we would put him down on a mat with some crayons and coloring books. And we would get about measuring trees because we wanted to know how much, how much were the elephants altering the forest. We were measuring trees. And, and one day when we were out there measuring the trees and he, my son was sitting there on his little blanket, I, I was about to measure a tree and, a, and then I saw it move. Oh my gosh. Sure. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. And what I hadn't realized is while we were there working away, doing our stuff, and chatting to ourselves, to each other, this family of elephants had moved in and then they fell asleep, but standing amongst us. Wow. And they're just standing there, but because this bushy plant was everywhere, we couldn't see them, but until I went to try and like measure this tree, it was not a tree, it was a leg of an elephant. And we realized we were just surrounded by elephants. And so we just had to quietly tiptoe back, pick up the baby, <laughs> pick up our stuff and exit the forest. And the elephants, they must have been aware we were there. There's no way they came and, and didn't realize we were there. But they were just hanging out and they were very calm and relaxed. And that's maybe what I feel about how mesmerizing elephants are, is they're very, um, they understand when they're under threat and they're dangerous if they feel that they need to protect themselves. But if they feel there's no danger here, they're fine. And that just and, brings and, me to what we were saying earlier, just about that pressure they're feeling and because the date for us when that step when you were doing that study Paula was that 10 years 15 years ago when you were doing your study oh, in Shimba Hills that was much more that was in um 
that was in 2000, um, 2004. Sorry, okay. just a second. Sorry. Yeah. So almost 20 years, almost 20 years yeah, ago. 20 years, 20 years ago. And how much the environment and the climate has changed now that do you think that that story of elephants falling asleep around you while you're conducting, do you think that could happen today with the way the forests and the landscape have changed? Well, it has happened to me again more recently, but I wasn't on foot. I was in a car. Hmm. We were filming for Wildlife Warriors season one, and we were filming a particular elephant that I had fallen in love with. His name was Tim. And Tim was a, the leader of a group of bulls. They were phenomenal. He was this spectacular giant male. And um, he had all these other bulls around him. Some of them were his cousins, his relatives. And we know this because they that was in Amboseli and those elephants are so well known. So they, they all had names. And from their names, we knew who they were related to because the way the naming system works. And Tim and all of his mates were together. There were eight of them including his young cousin, who was quite a small young bull. And uh, I had a National Geographic team with us. And, and we were waiting and filming these elephants. And I noticed their behavior. So unless you've watched elephants, you might not be able to predict what they're going to do next. You mm -hmm. might just think they're, I don't know, just standing around trying to cool off. But when they're sleeping, standing up, it's quite obvious because they they start to rock back sideways back and forth and they will form a pincer movement kind of a shape like they'll all be facing bums together heads out kind of like in a protective uh, arrangement and we noticed them they look sleepy and then they walked off into the open and then and as we were watching them I told the cameras because everyone stopped filming because it was not the place where we wanted to film and I told put your cameras back on they're about to go to sleep they're going, to, they're going to lie down. And nobody could believe because everyone says elephants don't lie down. That's the belief. Everyone says they don't lie down. I said, they're going to lie down. And, and it was just from the way they were behaving, I could just see what was about to happen. And uh, they started going down one by one, like almost like dominoes, just dropping to the ground. These huge, huge moves. And they fell asleep and they started snoring. But what was amazing was to see they that- snore? Elephants snore? They, Elephant snore. Snore? they totally snore. <laughs> and it's quite loud. <laughs> <laughs> and they, we were so close to them. We were maybe a few meters from them. And they lay down in front of the cars and their trunks were all touching each other. It's like they're so, mm -hmm. they're so interconnected with each other. And the youngest one, Townsend, he woke up first. They slept for like two hours. And I took a photograph of them sleeping and everyone thought they had been killed, like they'd been poisoned or something. I was telling them, no, they're just sleeping. They're just, they're just chilled out. Yeah. And Townsend woke up first and he walked around and he started touching all the other big bulls with his back foot, just checking to see how close they are to waking up. And wow. nobody was about to wake up. So he lay down again next to Tim, touching Tim. It was very, very sweet. Beautiful. But you know, what was, what's really interesting is this idea that elephants, when they're not threatened or under pressure, they are very relaxed and they're not really that dangerous. And we know this, that the relationship with humans and elephants uh, is maybe we've lost, we've lost that. Like I can sit in a car and the elephants maybe in a very touristy area will behave as if I don't, I'm not there. But I have friends who grew up with elephants maybe 50 years ago. I have a friend from a, a town called Wajia. It's a very, very dry place now, but it never used to be that dry. In, back then, it was there was a river and it was green and lush and big trees and there was lots of pasture and they had lots of livestock. And he said there were elephants around all the time, and that and it's quite well known that that's in that area there were lots of elephants. And he said that when they were children going to school, they would walk to school and the boys would play a game, which was to run under the belly of the elephants, on the way to school. You're kidding! Wow. And yeah, and he said that that was. That was the norm. Nobody ever got hurt. Yeah. Today, you wouldn't even dream of trying to get that close to an elephant, let alone go under the belly of an elephant as a kid. Um, and he said that that community, um, when the poachers came to, during the time of the ivory trade, they the community didn't really think much. They were being paid money, maybe. Some of them got jobs. They let them slaughter the elephants. And he said that many years have gone by now. The trees are gone, the grass is gone, the river's dried up. And they now are saying, 
they're asking me, how can you help us to get elephants back? Because they now understand elephants were creating the environment that allowed nature to thrive. Right. And now they can't keep livestock. There's no grass, there's no pasture, there's nothing. They can't even keep livestock. So pe- the suffering is very extreme. So the, the important role of humans and elephants and the, and the relationship with them, which we can sense in the way that we interact with each other, is something that's evolved over hundreds of thousands yeah. of years. And we kind of know it, but we don't acknowledge it because our science today probably cannot capture that anymore because we've destroyed that relationship. So let's talk about that, Paula, because I I want, this is so much of what Wildlife Direct does. Advocacy seems like a very slow way to address the problem. seems very daunting. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to focus on that? And maybe you can tell us, you know, specifically, you know, the how the Hands Off Our Elephants campaign worked. At what point did you know it was successful? So I guess I have a couple of questions embedded in there. You know, why advocacy? How did that campaign work? And at what point did you know this was catching on? Well, in in, um, in around 2000, when we realized that elephants, uh, the ivory trade was about to be reopened. Uh, um, I was still doing my PhD research at that time. I went back to the government to work for them in 2002 when I finished my PhD. And I realized, you know, what I wanted was to work within government in order to drive change. And I found that the higher I rose in government, the more difficult it was to actually do anything. Mm. I was My job was becoming pure administration. I was paper pushing. And there was, there was just no um, meaningful, out, you know, there was nothing meaningful that I could achieve, really. And so I moved out of that and I, and I went back to square one thinking, what do I really want to to do in my life. And um, when I eventually came back to conservation in the form of Wildlife Direct as this, and now as the CEO of Wildlife Direct and seeing the kind of challenges, I realized that while there are so many amazing people all over Africa doing incredible work on the ground, it's like, it's like a drizzle in a desert. There isn't enough money and enough support to connect all these initiatives in a way that they have a multiplier effect. They are all just little drops that are just disappearing into the sand on their own. And that, I found that very disturbing that um, everybody who's doing their work thinks that make doing an amazing job. And it was Richard Leakey who said to me, when he saw one of the projects I was working on, he said, this is all well and good, but if you have no control over the environment, the, the larger environment, it doesn't matter how much work you do on this little problem here, it's going to blink out. This, it's not going to work. And by the larger environment, do you mean literally the surrounding landscapes to where you're working? No. So at the time, we were building bridges to help monkeys cross a road. And the reason why they had to cross the road was to get from one part of the forest to the other part of the forest. And he said, but what are you doing about saving the forest? If you can't save the forest, and there's no point of building these bridges. Right. And if and you can't save the forest on your own, you need government to help you to protect these forests. And that was something that I I didn't even like the idea of having to go and lobby for forest protection. I felt like that it, it seems too hard. For most people, it just seems too damn hard. You know, it's really hard to navigate government, especially when you're coming from a background of science. And so after we we had looked at all the conservation um, projects we'd been supporting all across Africa. We realized there were certain themes that kept coming up again and again. One was poaching and one was poisoning of wildlife. And advocacy seemed like a really good way of connecting the dots. When it came to this elephant situation in particular, there were loads and loads of people working on elephant conservation and everybody had a campaign, raising money, put petrol in our motorbikes, buy boots on the ground, Um, help us to catch these poachers. And it didn't make sense. So much money was being spent, but yet poaching was just getting worse and worse and worse. So Paula, I don't don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to interrupt you because I think poaching is one of those things that people don't understand. We talk about it, but it mm -hmm. feels like, you know, masked men in the night coming with huge guns. So could you just break down for us what you mean by poaching or even... Mm -hmm. Do it justice in, in a real snippet of kind of what okay. poaching looks like for us in this. So, yeah, I mean, so most people think of, of um, 
you know, wildlife criminals are people out there with uh, machine guns who are gunning down these poor, innocent animals. That is how it's always been portrayed to us, that, that these are villains killing our animals. Well, actually, there's a whole chain of people. There is a buyer somewhere in China. There's a middleman somewhere in Dubai. There is a shipping agent. There is a clearing company in Kenya. There are corrupt officials who are also, there's the whole huge line of people involved in moving this product called ivory from a living elephant all the way across the world to a place like China. And the poachers themselves, even doesn't matter how many of them you catch, and somebody else will be hired to do that job because it's the really the lower end of the problem. So we, we found that most conservation organizations were focusing on that part of the problem, in paying for intelligence, for arrests, for boots on the ground, for fences, and all kinds of things because to them, the, the enemy was this guy called the poacher. Um, when we started looking into it, we felt that, no, actually, if we really want to make a difference, we need to find out where the pinch points are in the movement of ivory. And we found that that really is the port of Mombasa, which was most of the ivory is moving across Africa, is coming into the countries with the worst controls. And Kenya happened to be one of those countries and the port of Mombasa. And initially, we thought we would simply help government to arrest people who were involved in this trafficking of ivory which we felt was more, which is a bigger problem than the poaching problem. But what we found is that it wasn't that government didn't know who they were. It was the whole chain was broken. Even if you arrest somebody, a case would never make it through court. Hmm. And there was no, there was nothing to discourage a, a poacher or a trafficker or a dealer or a buyer of ivory because the laws were simply uh, not good enough and the courts didn't recognize this as a problem. People were getting off, uh, police were being bribed, court judges were being bribed. There was all kinds of problems along the whole chain. And because it was not seen as a serious problem, you could always buy your way out of it. I'm just imagining water coming through a ceiling with multiple holes and yeah. you're just putting your finger in multiple holes trying to keep the water out and it's still leaking at every, every turn. So this Hands exactly. Off Our Elephant campaign it's, it's been a couple of years now since you started it. You still see those stickers around Nairobi. You still hear people mm -hmm. talking about it. What was the impetus behind that? And, and what was the idea that was different that you were trying to introduce? Right. So we, we initially said the problem that we thought that nobody was touching on was the problem in the courts. Because if the courts could make it too expensive and too risky, for people to get involved in this business, they would stop because they're in it for the money. So if it's too expensive or they're too likely to go to jail, they would stop. The same criminals are doing other, other kinds of crimes. And they had just switched to ivory because it was easy. Hmm. They were still selling guns. They were still selling drugs and other things. But ivory was just one of their products. So we decided that we were going to go through the court, through the court system. Uh, we were going to expose it through the court court system and we came we did a survey and we revealed 70 percent of the no we revealed that 78 percent of all the wildlife crimes in the Kenyan courts were not going anywhere because files were getting lost or misplaced which basically means corruption and the hands off our elephants campaign came around because we were so frustrated nobody was taking it seriously we felt when we were asked by a PR company, what is it you really want? We said, we just want people to get their hands off our elephants. And they said, okay, that's the name of our campaign. We want people to stop threatening our elephants. That's really what it was, but it's our elephants. It's not just the elephants, these are our right, elephants. Right, right. And, and we want them to get their hands off our elephants. And so it became a Kenyan owned and driven campaign. There was no longer an NGO or, um, especially not an international NGO driving this, it was local. And we, we organized demonstrations in the streets of Nairobi to, to basically send a message to the government that we are all in it. And, and it was amazing. People would come on crutches, on wheelchairs. People would fly in from other African countries. Young students would come, uh, children would come, grandparents would be there. And when I asked people, why are you in the march? Because the marches became quite large, like 4,000 people would show up. They would say, it's the one thing we can do. It's the one thing that we can do to show that we care. 
And it, it really is, it really is heartbreaking that actually there are very few opportunities for ordinary people to participate in conservation, but they felt that their presence in this march was sending a very vital message to the government of Kenya. And that those marches, which the government then basically, basically took ownership of because the minister started working with us, the ambassadors were working with us, you know, it became, it became quite a big celebration. Yeah. Um, it, it led the government to now start taking the, recommendations we were making very seriously. And at one point we went into a very big government meeting. We made in recommendations and they accepted all 13 and they gave us, uh, you know, the right to basically follow up with every government agency. And that included changing the law, more ra- more rangers being hired, more equipment for them. There were, you know, more education, training of prosecutors and magistrates, the creation of the wildlife prosecution unit, creation of a court of courts in places that had never been courts for wildlife, for example, Mombasa, Nairobi Airport, and that kind of thing. And that that sent a message um, across the whole government that this is now a national priority. So in terms of campaigning, that's why it was so important. It became a national priority that Kenya was recognized and took great pride in that we were able to stem the poaching before we lost that many elephants, we probably lost a few thousand, maybe 2,000, but neighboring Tanzania lost over 75% of their elephants over the same oh, period. Wow. wow. They wow. used to have 80,000 elephants. Imagine, I mean, they, so the, the, the fact that we were able to make that difference just by a citizen-led initiative is why I really believe in advocacy. And That's it's not so easy. easy. It's difficult. It's quite difficult because what you have to do is Tell, tell people that they're not doing enough. Enough, yeah. But you know, it's but it's not it's not easy. But at the same time, like you said, it's what everyone felt like they could do. They could show up and they could walk. It sent a signal to the government that the citizens are aware. And I think Paula, you know, kudos to the team that, like you said, it was Kenya owned because I think that's also key, right? An outside organization coming to the UN and making a big speech about this has happened in Kenya is almost, you know, it's quite empty. But your own people, you know, organizing and and walking and marching says quite a different message. You've taken that advocacy work now to filmmaking and you've taken some of those messages of both ownership. These are our elephants. These are our communities, our landscape and the importance of it, the urgency of the message to the films that you're making. Two seasons of Wildlife Warriors. Congratulations. Uh, several episodes in particular of season two have won all kinds of awards um, from the Jackson Wild Festival, from many other festivals. So huge congratulations. Tell me why storytelling? How is storytelling an advocacy tool? And and when, at what point did you realize, huh, <laughs> I should take my storytelling and put my advocacy together and it's a happy marriage? The storytelling part of it was uh, not natural because, especially when you're a scientist, you tend to like come with facts. Data, you know, like, data. Facts, <laughs> no figures. And you, you expect everybody to, you know, feel the same way about it. I, I was very lucky to have met a man who trains public speakers. He was in Kenya for something else altogether. Somebody introduced him to me. And I called him and I told him, I have to make an important speech and I need your help because I need to get people to respond and take action and it was him who really made me understand the power of storytelling and I was speaking in Davos actually and this man's name is Richard Green and he said he he listened to my speech and in 20 minutes he reformed the whole thing and he said he said you need a story you need a really good story that is going to make us all stop and feel because it's not about the facts and figures. It's about how it makes us feel. You know, one of the things I love about Wildlife Warriors is that every episode features a different conservationist, a different wildlife warrior who has, you know, given their life and their expertise to a specific animal. Where did that idea of shaping every episode on an individual and showcasing kind of the expertise and the bravery, the courage, the commitment of African conservationists come to mind? Where's, where did that come from? It was, a, it was a very interesting journey. When we first started thinking about this series, we thought about having celebrities as our device to get eyeballs of our public. And the first person we brought in and did a trial with just didn't work. Hmm. And we, would, we were left with <laughs> 
<laughs> we were left with these incredible scientists, but the host was unable to carry a conversation. And and that and so that's when we we looked at it. We we're like, we don't need we don't need a celebrity. These people are celebrities on their own. And, and they have so become knowledge. that. They've become yeah. celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> they're so passionate. They're so knowledgeable. They're so exciting. Um, there's so much fun. They're so they're so down to earth and grounded. And it's a, it's an interesting thing because a lot of international film crews had warned me that you know Kenyans they're not very good on camera. They're so shy. They they stumble. They stutter. Their English is really not that great. We found the opposite. We found that because our crew is Kenyan, yeah, the, the people being interviewed never felt intimidated or worried about do I look good enough or anything. We found that they actually embraced this idea of the camera and the storytelling. And then the more people watch the show, the more they want to be on the show. Absolutely. You know, more people want to be on the show and more people feel um, confident enough to tell their stories, sometimes very personal and tough stories. I mean, I had a man in one episode who actually breaks down and cries on camera, which is so unusual for an African man. And he didn't, he didn't say, turn off the cameras, please take that out. You know, he was like, it's, people need yeah. to know this is how passionate I am about this particular issue. Um, so I found that, that it was not just that we have Kenyan heroes at the front line, it's that we have Kenyan crew who are very easy for the for our heroes to relate to as well. That's that's huge. I mean, you know, language, culture, that familiarity, that comfort allows that story to come to the surface instead of having to break through yet one other barrier after barrier, which is so critical. Not only do our heroes need to be grassroots, but our crews need to be grassroots. Our yeah. the whole the whole um, system needs to originate here. And it absolutely the potential for that is. And I think one of the beautiful things that your work is doing is creating more opportunities for that to be the reality for so many things. So, so many shows. And I so appreciate that about the work that you're doing. It's creating more and more opportunity for the next show and the next young person to think, oh, it's possible because I've seen that happening, which is, which is, awesome. yeah. do you have, do you have a favorite episode from um, the two seasons? <laughs> I know it's you like know, asking I, your favorite child, but I got to do it. I know. <laughs> I love all the episodes and not just because of what we captured in the end, because some of them we got better stuff than yeah. others. And some of them were just incredible experiences that were surprising, that forced us to think on our feet and prove ourselves when things just didn't seem like they were going to work. You know, yeah. we filmed, for example, we were filming Cheetah in Northern Kenya and there wasn't a cheetah in sight. <laughs> <laughs> no cheetah anywhere. <laughs> and we, the whole episode was about climate change. It's dry, it's desert, and these poor cheetah are struggling to survive. And I had done a very big recce. I'd spent a week out there reccying the whole episode and everything. And when we got there, it rained for 10 days oh, in the wow. middle of the desert. And it was like this it, we were just laughing. And there's a photo of me with my hands on my hips, and I'm wearing a raincoat, and I'm just laughing. Facing because it didn't matter. Whatever we were going to do is not going to happen. We have to rethink the whole episode and um, and tell it in a different way, which was which was really, really amazing. But I have to say there was one episode which I really, really loved. So we always had surprises. One episode was in Reteti, which is the elephant sanctuary. Yes, northern um, Kenya. Yeah. And that sanctuary is a community owned sanctuary. And it, it was established against all odds. So for the community to look after elephants already, it's almost like saying community looking after snakes. People don't like elephants in some of these places. They're terrified of elephants, so they hate them. But here you have a community. They've adopted these baby elephants because they want to look after their own elephants and return their own elephants back to the wild. Beautiful story. They have women looking after elephants. The first place where we actually have women being caretakers of baby elephants. Another beautiful angle. So we did the recce. Everything was perfect. But a few days before the shoot, they told us they didn't have any accommodation. And they said, you better bring all your own accommodation. So I was like, okay, that's a curveball. Okay, we'll that hire, is. <laughs> we'll just hire an overlander and we'll take this huge truck, which will carry the tents and the kitchen and the everything. And so off we go to Northern Kenya in this massive truck, which is a slow and ponderous, but we get all the way out there. We're arriving 
late afternoon and we go off the main road, which was, I mean, the light and everything was so beautiful. We go off the main road and after only a few minutes, the truck gets stuck in the sand. It just literally just sinks. And there was nothing but nothing was going to get this truck out of the sand. So my first reaction was to be extremely angry because we, we, there was no way we were going to get to the shoot on time. And we had to now put up our camp in the middle of nowhere. So we started like trying to think about where we're going to put up our camp. And a, a random person in the middle of literally, there was nobody out there. This guy shows up and he says, hi, Paula. And no like, way. And I was like, uh, hello, who are you? He says, oh, my name is Festus. He says, I know you from Facebook. And I was like, okay. And he says, what are you doing? I told him about the problem we had. He said, well, why don't you come and camp at my house? And at first I thought, this is going to be one of those stories that ends badly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so we go, but we were stuck, literally. And he said, he said, you don't want to be out here in the middle of nowhere. You never know what can happen. Come to my house. I've got, I've got a fence around it. You'll be safe. So we all moved to his house. We put up our tents. And um, while we're there, and it was, again, one of those weird things where it rained. There was, it was just so bizarre. Very, very bizarre situation. And um, Festus then invites his friend over, who is a local storyteller from the Samburut tribe. So in the tribe, they have these people who are the keepers of the stories of the tribe, an older guy. And we're sitting under the stars, around a fire, and this guy starts telling us about the stars and the meanings of the stars and what it in their culture and their tradition. And as they learned more about the shoot and what we were going to film, they helped us to rethink the whole episode and to bring in much more of a cultural angle to go to the village. To, and I ended up meeting the women and going with them with their donkeys, loading the donkeys and going down to the water to get water because that's where the baby elephants were falling into the wells sure. that were dug by the women. So we ended up having half of the episode was really about the culture and the people and the traditions, which would never have been the case. It would have just been about baby elephants. And that to me was, was a very um, surprising and powerful way of taking, I guess we just, we didn't know anybody out there. Yeah. And all of us, this generosity of this community who just were like, we're going to help you. We're going to introduce you to people. I milked a camel. I drank camel's milk. I mean, it was fantastic. It was one of those experiences, you know, you can't pay for those kinds of experiences. You, you can't. Know? And I think that it, it's, it goes to also the power again of, of storytelling for advocacy, because I think now on the screen, instead of somebody just seeing these baby elephants are being raised by the community and we should do more to help them, what you're seeing is a whole culture connected, saying to other Kenyans, this is a, an extension of you, you in Nairobi. This is a part of being Kenyan that, that this you may not have been here yeah. before, but actually a part of our culture is connected to to these elephants and this story. And then that now incentivizes, I think, action. It, it gives yeah. you something you did not have before. Right. Knowledge is power. Yeah. You didn't have that knowledge before. And now you do. And so you are more incentivized to show up with this knowledge that you have that actually yeah. keeping elephants it's a part of our culture and a part of what we do. And I think that's quite powerful. And without kind of the vehicle of why they're four years and that, that story stays in Northern Kenya yeah. it doesn't make it to that, us. That, in yeah. Nairobi. Absolutely. And that story in a way it revealed that we all think of ourselves, maybe in Nairobi, we're so modern, um, but the people of Northern Kenya who are able to survive and thrive in an environment that is so harsh and they, there's no way we could have survived. Right. We, we probably would have turned around and come back to Nairobi, but they, they helped us. They helped us to see how do you survive in this incredibly dry, harsh, hot environment. We learned so much and on, on the way every day we had to drive to the elephant sanctuary as well to, to do a little bit of shooting there. And on one of the days, there was somebody walking who was hitchhiking, a very old lady, an extremely old lady. So we picked her up and, and we, we gave rides to people and we, you know, we towed cars and stuff. But in this particular case, we picked up this lady and she sat in the car and she just told stories and she laughed. And, I mean, and when we got to the sanctuary, we found out she was the grandmother of the woman who was the heroine of the story. So oh this really goodness. amazing, yeah. uh, you know, serendipitous things happened. 
And it just made it just made me feel like everything is somehow they're all connected. It's all connected, it's, absolutely. It forms a circle in the end. Yeah, it was absolutely. it was, it was um, definitely my favorite shoot in the sense of uh, the way that we connected with that community. Fantastic. It's um, it it just brings to the surface, I think, to the connectedness, you know, because of course that those communities, those counties, are probably the most affected now by the climate crisis, by the degradation of the environment. Um, you know, Nairobi is right now. It's you know we had some rains in December, so things are okay. It looks okay around here now. But I know those communities have suffered so much over the last few years, Paula. And in your work as an environmentalist, while you focus on elephants and, and on wildlife, it's it's connect, it's connected to the climate crisis. It's all yeah. it's all connected. It's one web. Exactly. What are you seeing um, that alarms you the most? And what are you seeing that's giving you hope? Because you're also working with a lot of young people and you're traveling the world and you're getting to work with other scientists and other thinkers. So you also have this unique opportunity to engage in places that a lot of us on the ground don't. So tell us yeah. both things, you know, what's alarming you around what you're seeing in this region around the climate crisis and, and what's also giving you hope? Yeah. I would say what alarms me the most is that we know so much and we still don't make the right decisions. We have leadership that should know better, but still chooses to do things that is clearly taking us in the wrong direction. And, and by that, I mean things like allowing livestock into national parks when you can see that the pasture is already overgrazed outside of the parks. So we are now threatening what was supposed to be the reserve of biodiversity. We are impacting on that as well. Um, we're seeing far too many developments inside the Masai Mara. We're seeing uh, land being subdivided when it's clearly not compatible with conservation or permissions for people to grow avocados in the middle of an elephant corridor. That I find extremely alarming because we are a smart country with very smart people. We have some of the best research in the entire continent and somehow we're not making sense of it. We're not synthesizing all this knowledge to improve how we manage the land and the, how we manage the land impacts on the natural wealth of our nation. Kenya as one of the most biodiverse countries in the world is losing uh, that value very quickly. So I think we could be smarter, a lot smarter. Where do I see hope? I mean, first nature is incredibly resilient in the sense that the moment you stop threatening things, it can recover. If I look at the conserv conservancy movement in Kenya and how wildlife numbers have recovered in some places, it gives me hope that um, it doesn't take that much to see results and, and for people to realize, oh, that's all we need to do is stop destroying trees here or start planting trees and things can recover. And I'm especially hopeful when I see young people doing conservation. So through our series and through our events that we hold and we invite people to come and talk to us, I, what I see is it's no longer just silence, radio silence from young people. It used to be that people wait for the older generation to tell us what to do. We don't see that anymore. Now young people are stepping out, speaking up, um, demanding change, demanding an audience, are investing, are, are actually making philanthropic contributions, are volunteering and doing things on the ground. You know, there's a group that in, has gone into Nairobi Park where the water holes have dried up. So imagine here in the city of Nairobi, we could see the same level of wildlife population collapse as Amboseli because the water is now gone. And young youth groups are coming together, buying tankers of water and taking them into the national park, paying for dams to be desilted and then filling them up with water. And just to see the wildlife just comes flooding back very quickly the moment they see there's water. These are not people with enormous amounts of money, but they've got networks, they've got friends, and they have so much passion. That gives me enormous amount of hope. You know, so long as so long as people can see that on their on their own or in their groups, they can make a difference. They keep doing it. To me, that that's really amazing. With all that is happening around you with storytelling, with advocacy, tell us what's next for Wildlife Direct and for the work that you're doing. Oh, this is great. This is a really good question. So Wildlife Direct um, came into wildlife filmmaking 
in a sideways <laughs> approach. And we found that ourselves in a space that is incredibly fertile and exciting. The opportunities are fantastic. The amount of energy, interest, and creativity is just ready. So we're trying to, to form now the first Kenyan Wildlife Filmmakers Association that will give us a legal standing as a body of filmmakers to engage government, to attract funds, and to work on projects that we really care about. We are also partnering with other organizations to develop the sector because it's totally un undeveloped. It's really strange that we have a huge film industry in this country. Lots of people have been trained in filmmaking, but nobody's been trained in wildlife filmmaking. So we're partnering with the same people who have been making films in this country, um, but without us. <laughs> we're now actually partnering with them to help train us, employ us, and um, support us in producing new content. So that includes the BBC, the American University, um, National Geographic and Disney, and many others. And what we see is that it's not just about job creation and um, you know developing the technologies. It's, it's really about this concept that the limitations for us is literally our imagination. The opportunities for storytelling in this space, it's not just documentaries. It's children's storytelling, it's fiction, it's drama, it's uh, crime. There are so many ways of telling wildlife stories and mainstreaming it in all forms of media. And that is something that Kenyans have told us they want to participate in. We, we now have this exciting opportunity of partnering with the Kenya Wildlife Service. They've said that they believe this is really important as well. And so... Um, yeah, we're raring to go. It's uh, that's awesome. It's going to be a very exciting three years ahead. Well, I can't wait. I'll I'll be there watching, waiting, participating, and cheering you on. It's just been um, wonderful to see how much you have already contributed to the sector. What Wildlife Direct as an organization continues to lead the way, and I can't wait to see what comes next. So, before we let you go, we we always ask our guests before they leave two questions. First of all, what's your favorite drink, Paula? When you when you have a moment to sit back, relax, and take it in, you know what's in your cup. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, my favorite drink is Earl Grey tea. Earl Grey when tea. I, yeah. When I really need to just like, I want to say defrag. I just need to to come <laughs> back to a place of extreme comfort, and you know. Back to myself, it's all great tea. <laughs> oh, that's so, you know, in Ethiopia, we have this word miskin, which means just like precious. Like that's just <laughs> such a miskin answer. Unexpected, but very, very sweet. Okay. And then, and lastly, you know, we, we focus on stories of joy and justice. So Paula, what is bringing you joy at this moment? What brings me joy? Oh gosh, a lot of things. What brings me joy is working... Uh, with so many young people who are so, they are just like sponges ready to, to be excited about everything. It's almost like reliving my life again, multiple times through many, many forms. That gives me a lot of joy to see how this work is getting spread. Very exciting. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on Salam and Hello. You've brought us a lot of joy with your stories, the stories of the elephants. As much as there is heaviness in this sector, you've brought us a lot of joy today. And thank you. Thank you for your time and your work and your light. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Lily. Thank you for, for prioritizing this kind of issue. I know it's not everyone's you know, primary go-to kind of story, but I'm, I really appreciate that you've made this important. Mm. Well, the honor is mine.
Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'd love to hear your feedback. So as always, my email is lily at salamandhello.com or you can message us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at salamandhello. We would love to hear from you. So send us a message and let us know what you thought of today's conversation. On Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, you can reach us at Salam and Hello, or you can email me, lily at salamandhello.com. And we have a relaunched website. So you can go to salamandhello.com and send us a message there as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.